Welcome to episode 1 of Cyberpunk 101, where we take a deep dive into the great movies, books, games, and shows of the past that have helped shape and form this subgenre of science fiction. The plan with this series is to introduce you guys to the most influential people, stories, ideas, and IPs that have been instrumental in the creation of cyberpunk, and what makes high tech and low life so special. From William Gibson to Blade Runner to the man who first came up with the term cyberpunk, to western versus Japanese interpretations, to even the queen of cyberpunk, this series aims to leave no stone unturned. I hope you guys follow along for the ride, and if you are from the future, do check out the Cyberpunk 101 playlist in the description for more. Let's go! If you guys have been following the channel, you'd know that my first exposure to elements of the cyberpunk genre was with The Matrix in 2001 as a kid, and Ghost in the Shell as a young adult. In fact, I didn't even know that cyberpunk as a genre even had a name until everything came full circle when Cyberpunk 2077 was touted by many as the Ghost in the Shell game in early 2018. The 1995 anime was one of those pieces of media that I stumbled upon 10 or so years ago that legitimized anime for me, but there was always something stopping me from moving beyond that and discovering the rest of the universe. Maybe it was so that I didn't tarnish the image of that experience, or maybe it was even the off-putting art style in the most recent entries, but I never really dove any deeper into the universe after the Oshi original and the follow-up Innocence. However, over the last few weeks, I've fervently consumed almost every single piece of Ghost in the Shell media, the various mangas, the anime series, the animated and live-action movies, and I'm really glad that I did. So today, I'm going to be giving you guys a complete rundown on one of the most iconic cyberpunk and post-cyberpunk franchises to date, including everything you need to know about the world and history of Ghost in the Shell, a list of every show, movie, and manga option, where you should start, and a total ranking of all the entries, terms and themes you should know to help you understand the world of Ghost in the Shell, the lore and backstory, and just why this futuristic dystopian setting is so outstanding. Ghost in the Shell, although most well known for the gorgeous 1995 anime, actually began as a Japanese manga series in the late 1980s, written and illustrated by Masamune Shiro. It first appeared in the manga magazine known as Young Magazine Zokan Kaizo Koban from 1989 to 1991 and was compiled in a Tankobon volume, which is Japanese for independently appearing book. The 1995 film, directed by Mamoru Oshii, oddly enough, did have a major influence on filmmakers The Wachowskis later down the line for The Matrix, with the iconic intro for Ghost in the Shell inspiring the green digital code strands and the ports on the back of characters' heads. Not only did Ghost in the Shell inspire the iconic Matrix franchise, but James Cameron also cited Ghost for inspiring Avatar. Bungie used it as a template for Oni, and the Metal Gear series alongside Deus Ex and Cyberpunk 2077 took major cues from the IP. Only Blade Runner and its precursor do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep and William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy, namely Neuromancer, carry equal weighting in terms of influence when it comes to the proliferation of cyberpunk on a large scale. Within the realm of Japanese cyberpunk, Akira, whose manga released in 1982 and whose anime adaptation released in 1988, and Burst City, the 1982 Japanese dystopian punk rock film, predate Ghost in the Shell. But at the same time, GITS was well within those quintessential years for Japanese cyberpunk, and made the most strides in terms of communicating depth, philosophy, transhumanism, and consciousness. We'll talk a bit more about Japanese cyberpunk versus Western cyberpunk in a future video, but the point I'm trying to make here is that although an early entry well within the golden era of cyberpunk that spanned between the 1980s and 90s, Ghost in the Shell can't be credited for being the first cyberpunk interpretation coming out of Japan. So what exactly is the premise of Ghost in the Shell? Set in the mid-21st century with the majority of the entries being in 2029 after the fourth non-nuclear war, it tells the story of a fictional counter-cyber terrorist organization, Public Security Section 9, led by the main protagonist Major Motoko Kusanagi. Set in a fictional Japanese city of Nihama, also known as Newport City, it has a heavy emphasis on political corruption and cyber criminals. Ghost in the Shell is set in a world where cyberization of brains and interfacing with technology that is blending flesh and metal is commonplace. Cyberization of brains is one thing, but prosthetic bodies to house these cyber brains are also a possibility in this world. As you can imagine, if you have a cyberized brain or a prosthetic body, that kind of leaves you open to being hacked. 
The thing I appreciate about Ghost in the Shell is that these modifications are almost always under the surface, hidden from the viewer's eye, and integrated in a less in-your-face manner. The only real distinguishing elements on if someone has a cyber brain is some of the interface plugs on the back of the neck, but otherwise it's hard to know who's man and who's machine. You'll almost never know if someone is in a prosthetic body because of the world's technological prowess in replicating the human body, which plays to the hand of many of the concepts that GITS delivers. The world and the stories really illustrate just how terrifying loss of domain over your brain is, with remote puppets, implanted thoughts, consciousness dubbing, brainwashing, and mind control as potential possibilities in this universe. So the core premise of Ghost in the Shell is what makes man and machine different in a future where the lines are blurred. What is consciousness or a ghost? Is one still human if all there is left is a brain housed in a prosthetic body or shell? What does being human even mean? As I mentioned before, Ghost in the Shell, at least the version in the standalone complex universe, which is the bulk of the IP, takes place in the mid-21st century after the events of World War III and World War IV. World War III was a nuclear war and involved wealthy and powerful developed countries whose reduction to rubble resulted in global balance of power changes, fracturing long-established national boundaries and concentrations of populations. World War IV followed shortly after. Also known as the Second Vietnam War, this further fragmented the globe with the collapse of a variety of developing and third world states. The result is a heavy balkanized geopolitical landscape, where nations like the US have been divided into smaller and less stable segments. Civil wars and revolutionary movements are widespread, and there are millions of refugees who have been displaced that are starting to weigh on the global infrastructure and economy. Interestingly enough, Japan is now a major world superpower and has even managed to match the collective power of all the descendant countries of the former US. So how has Japan done this? Technological and scientific prowess. With nuclear fallout and contamination engulfing the globe, they were and are the only current country with access to radiation scrubber technology. The Japanese miracle and its nanomachines is the culmination of this technology. Now, although Japan is a world power, it still suffers from corruption, destruction, ethnic tensions from a post-war influx of Asian refugees, exploitation, widespread trade and abuse of illegal drugs, including cyber drugs, and the activities of organized crime syndicates like the Yakuza, just to name a few. The geography of Japan has also changed due to the wars, and Nihama or Newport City is now the population center. As a parliamentary democracy, political corruption is also an issue with corporate, military, and bureaucratic interests all colliding, leading to widespread surveillance and espionage. The rest of the world has also seen monumental changes. After World War III, the US was partitioned into the American Empire, the Russo-American Alliance, and the remnant state of the United States of America. The American Empire is the only state that plays a major role in world politics, and adopts a militaristic and imperialistic stance mainly directed at Latin America. Its weakened position resulted in a security pact with Japan who had escaped World War III untouched. AE is interested in co-opting the aforementioned Japanese miracle, and of course, as proprietary technology owned by the Japanese, everyone wants some sort of stake here. Now although not confirmed, it is implied that the United States has reunited under a single government in the events of Standalone Complex 2045. In the Ghost in the Shell universe, the fall of China began in 1999, when Beijing was destroyed by a massive meteor impact. China and Taiwan have reunited and unified China, and now is a multi-party democracy with a higher degree of political and personal freedom than ever before. This agreement obviously doesn't sit well with the American Empire, which is engaged in a second Cold War with China. China boasts the world's largest economy, and is part of a trading bloc which includes most of Southeast Asia and India, which just so happens to be the second largest economy. Chinese citizens, however, don't seem to see the benefit of this worldwide presence, as poverty is still rampant within. Now, Ghost in the Shell is not one cohesive universe and can be split up into the standalone complex universe, the Oshi movies, Arise, etc. Since not all of these follow the same timeline, just the same or similar characters in universe, in the standalone complex universe, China is known as the People's Republic of China, who were the primary adversary to Japan in World War III, whose bombings destroyed the cities and prefectures of Tokyo, Sendai, Nagata, Maizuru, as well as Okinawa Island. Korea, Mexico, and the Siak Republic which is a fictional state in the standalone complex universe, are also mentioned, so let's take a quick look at these. Korea has now merged North and South Korea to create the Republic of Korea. The American army has set up a military base on reclaimed land. 
In standalone complex second gig, Korea is engaged in a civil war through the fourth non-nuclear war. Mexico is also a prominent player and alongside Latin America was the victim of open imperialism by the American Empire after they were left militarily and economically devastated after the third and fourth world wars. The AE masked this undertaking through the guise of them overthrowing corruption within those nations. In the late 2020s, they had invaded and occupied much of Mexico. Psychological warfare and the killing of women and children were used in an attempt to break the spirits of the Mexican resistance. While initially successful, Mexican military and mercenary forces hired by the government fought back, eventually leading to the American-led coalition to withdraw with their tail between their legs, losing the goodwill of the international community. After this, Mexico would go on to absorb the countries of Central America. Serrano Genomics, which you'll see a lot in the SAC universe, is a cybernetics, electronics, and medical technology mega corporation and is based in Mexico, although it has worldwide influence. SEAC Republic is a state completely created for the Ghost in the Shell standalone complex universe. It occupies the present territory of Singapore and the surrounding Ryu, Indonesia. These territories have merged to become a new state adopting the old Singaporean government. So now that you know the overall state of the world, mainly from an SAC perspective, let's get into the characters that remain relatively consistent across most interpretations. Ghost in the Shell follows Public Security Section 9, an intelligence department under the Ministry of Home Affairs. It's an elite counterterrorism unit specializing in cyber warfare. In 2029, most forms of terrorism carry with it some sort of cyber threat or angle, and nothing is ever as it really first appears to be. Section 9 is more of a policing unit, but their members have extensive military and special ops backgrounds. Okay, so let's start off with the main character of the franchise, Motoko Kusanagi, otherwise known as the Major. A full-body cyborg and master of combat, marksmanship, and cyber warfare, she has risen in the ranks for her history of flawlessly executed missions and her prior service in the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. I should mention that the standalone complex version of the Major doesn't have the same doubts about herself and her identity as in Oshi's 1995 rendition, and there are some physical and mental characteristics to each variation of Kusanagi. The Major uses a variety of avatars in cyberspace across the universes, alongside different remote bodies at times to carry out missions and tasks, and she's often called female gorilla in the manga. Daisuke Aramaki, otherwise known as Mr. Aramaki, is the chief of Public Security Section 9 and was formerly of the ground self-defense force under Colonel Tanada. Adept in handling negotiations and finding loopholes for his team to operate to their maximum capability is his main task. In the SAC universe, he has a cyber brain, whereas in the film, he does not, and he's often called Chief, Monkey Chief, or Old Ape in the manga. Bato is a former member of the Japan ground self-defense rangers. With cybernetic eyes and a variety of enhancements, he is the muscle of Section 9, excels in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and boasts high combat skills. He is, however, not proven in cyber warfare like the Major. He's got an intense and comical side, and in the SAC universe is particularly attached to the Tachikomas, AI-driven spider tanks that sometimes join the crew during operations. Togusa, who is a former beat detective with the main office, is one of the newer members, and was recruited by Motoko herself. Apart from his cyber brain, his body is organic, and often gets teased for not being only a rookie, but also being unaugmented. He has an affinity towards old school weaponry, prefers a Mateba auto revolver, and is one of the only married members of the team. Saito is the cyborg sniper on the team who sports a Hawkeye cybernetic, which allows him to link to satellites to become even more accurate at long range shooting. Despite his Hawkeye, most of his body is organic, and is only second to Togusa in how much organic body remains. Ishikawa is an older team member who is proficient in cyber warfare and is excellent at information gathering, analysis, data manipulation, and network decoding. A former soldier, he supports the rest of his team from a cyber brain dive room and runs a safe house that doubles as a cyber brain pachinko parlor. Boma or Borma fills the same role as Ishikawa and supports background tasks like cyber based information gathering and analysis. A former role handling explosives in the military means he is generally called into tasks where explosions may be a focus. Then we have Azuma and Pazu, each of which fills a similar role to Togusa, with Pazu taking on a more serious approach and being skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and Azuma providing comic relief and being quite the chatterbox. So those are the characters, but GITS can get extremely jargony. So we're going to go over some of the most important terms you need to know to help you understand the world properly so that you can enjoy the manga and anime more. Trust me on this one, this will help you a ton. Okay, so let's start off with the cyber brain. 
This is a term for a brain that's been injected with micro machines and outfitted with cyberbrain implants and can now directly connect to the net or other cyberbrain users. This has led to enhancements and abilities like automated processing and search capabilities, information sharing, expansion of memory, long-term storage, and multilingual communication. With the cyberbrain, all brain activities are replaced by electrical signals. Communication is a big pro and can be undertaken by connecting one's cyberbrain to networks wired or wirelessly. Wired communications are typically more secure. Electronic warfare can also be done with the cyberbrain and include ghost hacking into another cyberbrain or defending one's own cyberbrain from attacks using firewalls known as barriers. Obviously, the drawbacks with the cyberbrain is that it can be hacked or tampered with. A ghost is something that is believed to be unique to humans, which separates humans and machines. With the boundary between humans and machines becoming extremely ambiguous due to cyberization, a ghost is essentially the soul or consciousness of a human, and much of the themes and stories in the universe are based on questions on how to define consciousness. A ghost hack is when your cyberbrain is breached and your barriers or firewalls are bypassed. After this occurs, your ghost can be hijacked, which is referred to as a ghost hack. If you have a target's ghost intrusion key, however, you can take control of them without the need for hacking. A barrier is known as a firewall designed to prevent hacking into cyberbrains. Attack barriers can fire back by burning the attacker's cyberbrain. Substitute barriers can direct hacking attempts away from the original target cyberbrain. And labyrinth barriers create mazes in cyberspace to confuse intruders. The technology that laid the foundation for cyberization is known as micromachines. This is microscopic tech capable of redesigning and reconstructing the human nervous system, as well as our world. This tech has various applications with cyberbrain, cybernetic bodies, vaccines, and even bioweapons. Micromachines have also allowed for more of a full understanding of the activity of the brain, the CNS, and the peripheral nervous system. So we know that cyberbrains are prominent in this near future dystopia, but so too are prosthetic bodies. The process of replacing parts of the human body with machinery to gain remarkable abilities is a core concept of Ghost in the Shell. This transhumanist endeavor poses numerous challenges, including the cost and psychological distress from separating the body and mind during the process. If you have a cyberized brain, you can also take remote control of a prosthetic body through hacking the body, which shows just how dangerous blending biology and machines can actually be. Thermal optic camo is equipment used by Section 9, mainly by the Major, that uses visual input from its surroundings to camouflage the user's appearance. It's also featured on arguably the most iconic shot from the original movie, which is replicated in a majority of the other media forms. Okay, so now that you have a good understanding of the state of the world, the characters, and the technology that acts as a foundation for the stories, let's go through the books, movies, and shows, give you a brief summary and my thoughts on them, and help you decide what you're going to give your attention to and what to ignore. Obviously, this is all my personal opinion, so I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, including if you disagree. Let's begin with what started it all, the original manga by Shiro Masamune. The original versions of these Japanese comics are read from right to left, and begin obviously with volume 1. The order of release of these manga books isn't the order that you should read it in, however, as 1.5, otherwise known as Human Error Processor, the next in the chronology released in 2003, and Volume 2, Man-Machine Interface released in 2001, which is meant to be read last. The manga builds out the world absolutely wonderfully and even features the key puppet master or puppeteer stories that are the basis for the 1995 anime, albeit in a bit of a different order and with a few changes. There are a few different standalone stories within the manga, with each lasting a max of 20 to 30 pages, with some having part 2s that will last another 20 to 30 pages. I have little to no experience with manga, so maybe this is a byproduct of that, but I devoured 1 and 1.5 and thought that they were great. There's some really interesting stories here. Most of all, I was truly captivated by Masamune's drawings. These short stories are politically and technologically dense which do require you to have some sort of understanding or knowledge of all these aspects and really pay attention, which some of you may not like. There were certainly many times where I felt things were going above my head, but I think Shiro really challenges the reader here, and I don't think there's anything really wrong with that. You likely won't understand many elements of Ghost in the Shell across the manga and the anime, but don't let that hold you back from experiencing it. I will admit this is going to be a barrier to entry, where if you need more exposition on these elements of the world, I would probably point you in the direction of watching standalone complex first. 
The manga also does get into techno babble territory, and there are some confusing illustrations, but overall, this is one of the best places to start for newcomers to the franchise. These books also infuse some levity and humor into the mix and are styled a little less seriously, especially when compared to Oshi's 1995 movie, but I really appreciated it. The contrast between the violence and oppression of the setting and the juxtaposition between this and the drawings is something that I've always found compelling. Fuchikomas, Tachikomas are AI-driven machines that help Section 9 on various assignments and bring most of the humor and dialogue here. Some will find that these moments of humor don't really fit with the overall themes explored in GITS, but I disagree and welcome the much-needed silliness that the Tachikomas bring. So I mentioned that I devoured Volume 1 and 1.5, but let's talk a little bit more about Volume 2, otherwise known as Man Machine Interface, which is a wacky departure and takes place almost exclusively in cyberspace. If you've read it, you might know what I mean when I say this, but this one was flat out unintelligible, so much so that it felt like a real slog to get through. I think there are some interesting themes posed here, but if 95% of the content of the story is going above your head, there's really no point in reading it after all. Maybe at some point in my life, the commentary here will make more sense, but at the moment, it's a hard recommendation to anyone other than probably a small subset of the population that are extremely well-read and have a fundamental understanding of cybersecurity, philosophy, and the metaphysical. Masamune also likes to jot down pure streams of consciousness in the form of notes at the bottom of some of these pages across all three books, which I actually really enjoyed reading, but again, many times I kept thinking to myself, what the fuck am I actually reading? That being said, if you're going to get 1 and 1.5 regardless, some of the new editions have all the Masamune mangas packaged into one, so it might make sense to pick that up and give it a whirl. If you're looking for a place to pick these up, I will leave some links in the description. Again, the first two volumes, 1 and 1.5, are wonderfully illustrated and to me are the definitive GITS art direction. Volume 2 takes a bit more of a computer rendered 3D approach which is actually common in modern ghost media, which I know a ton of fans, including myself, just flat out do not like. Panels in the original manga are dense, expressive, filled with fantastic line work, and although sometimes pretty illegible, are gorgeous. Even if you don't read a lick of the actual dialogue or text, I think these stand alone as awesome art books. There's something just so homey about 80s and 90s animations and drawings that just lure you in, and I think this is part of the appeal of the cyberpunk genre as a whole. A ton of media from the 80s and 90s has that distinct flair of the era that just can't be recaptured in modern works. It just feels really special to have a piece of art feel like it's transporting you not only to a different world, but also in a different real world time. It's no different from Cyberpunk 2020 and Cyberpunk Red. Although Red builds out the world as well as 2020, the original art just can't be surpassed even with some of the more modern 3D rendered images. On the tier list, I have Volume 1 at an A, 1.5 at a B+, and Volume 2 at a C-. Even though I like the stories in 1.5 and more focus on the rest of the team versus Motoko, it was the shortest of the three. Volume 1 has the puppeteer origin story and was lengthier, which is why I'm giving it a slight edge. Okay, so moving on, we have the Human Algorithm. The Human Algorithm is actually a relatively late addition to the Ghost in the Shell franchise, but also does slot into the earlier Shiro work and is a direct sequel to 1.5. The Human Algorithm offers a lengthier story about Motoko and the discovery of her empty prosthetic body in a compound, all told from the perspective of Section 9. I think overall I prefer when the Major is MIA and think that the rest of the Section 9 team for the most part tell more interesting stories. For whatever reason I didn't have a ton of faith in the Human Algorithm, but it's a very worthy entry into the franchise and tells one larger story instead of breaking it up into shorter stories like Shiro. The Human Algorithm is written by Junichi Fujisaku and illustrated by Yuki Yoshimoto, and both the writing and art is very compelling, and is much easier to read and follow than Masamune's work. The illustrations are beautiful, and the story told here, although not yet finished, is one of my favorites in the franchise. The latest entry comes out very soon, if it hasn't already, assuming you're watching this video a bit down the line, but The Human Algorithm does get a B plus from me. I did follow up my reading of The Human Algorithm with Global Neural Network, a collaboration between Masamune, the legendary creator, and some well-known western writers and artists. I thought the first two stories were pretty mediocre, whereas the last two stories were a bit more interesting but nothing revolutionary. Personally, I would skip this one. You will find out that Western interpretations of Ghost in the Shell are not as strong as their Japanese counterparts. On the tier list, I'm going to slot this one in at a C-. Okay, so if you've seen anything Ghost in the Shell related, it's more than likely from the 1995 anime, which has its most distinctive presence throughout pop culture. Up until the 1980s, anime was not popular in the West, and Ghost in the Shell, alongside the likes of Akira, very much changed this. What was formerly acknowledged in the West as being for kids, suddenly had a really cool adult factor to it. This is one of those ones where if you didn't understand the appeal of anime, it might have brought you in like it did with me. 
Directed by Mamoru Oshii, this is the holy grail of the whole franchise, and follows Motoko Kuzanagi in her hunt to track down a master hacker known as the Puppet Master. This one is truly a piece of art whose narrative focuses on the philosophy of identity and the self, how a technologically advanced world changes what it means to be human, life, death, rebirth, retaining memories and autonomy in the face of governmental protocols, and the reevaluation of restraints of the human body. Whereas Standalone Complex focuses more on political strife and struggle, Ghost in the Shell narrows its scope to Kusanagi and her struggle with her identity as a cyborg. All the credit in the world to Oshi, who had quite a bit of pushback from producers that the film was not action-oriented enough. He was stuck to his guns, acknowledging that more action would have helped the movie sell better, but decided that he didn't care. In essence, he decided to make Existential Crisis the movie because he wanted to. I do want to mention that the original 1995 anime was remastered and re-released as a 2.0 version in 2008 that swaps in 3D generated CGI shots for some of the more iconic traditional 2D animations. It is few and far between, but I really personally prefer the original that retains the original animation style because it really can't be replaced. I also want to mention that if you do pick up the first Ghost in the Shell manga, the puppeteer storyline in this book is slightly different, but you will get much more context on the ending of the film that you might find really interesting. Keep that in mind if you're jumping into the film for the first time. Now for me and for many others, Oshi's film is the pinnacle and is where music, animation, style, art direction, and philosophy combine to make something truly definitive. The wind chimes and pings that ring out over moments of quiet contemplation, flowing into shrill hymns and chants, rhythmic drums and Spanish guitar riffs, leave scenes with the perfect amount of hang time, and highlight each frame which could be a painting in and of itself. The fluid action sequences and painstakingly drawn environments also build out a world that feels authentic and awe-inspiring. GITS is known for iconic intros, some teetering on psychedelic, but none will be more iconic than this one. These briefs are meant to let you know what to expect from each entry into the franchise, so I won't spoil the ending for you for those who have not seen it. But if there's any piece of media that you should check out from this entire video, it is without a shadow of a doubt Oshi's original 95 classic. If you do have the chance, theatrical re-releases do happen as well, so if you can catch it in the theater, absolutely do go for it. You guys already know where this one lies, S tier all day long. Now Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence is the non-canon sequel to Ghost in the Shell and is surprisingly worthy of that title. It's an evolution of the artistic presence of 95, and builds out Bato and Togus' relationship. Again, headed by Oshi and co-produced by Studio Shiburi, you can tell that the animation fluidity and style has even further improved in the sequel. Innocence takes place in 2032, three years after the events of the first movie, and is a straight detective case. It follows Togusa and Bato as they unravel a series of deaths due to malfunctioning gynoids, which are sex dolls produced by a corporation known as Locus Solus. This story takes inspiration from my favorite story within the manga and has a more horror-like feeling from its more twisted script to its darker and grittier scenes and set pieces. The shot selection is immaculate, some segments look like they're straight ripped out from concept art, and the more 3D approach to some scenes actually kind of work in this one for me. My criticism for Innocence is that there are a bit too many philosophical one-liners that are dropped in quick succession, and after a certain part, the story begins to get hard to follow. It's still a rewarding watch, and I think it's very much a worthy successor to Oshi's original, which is a very, very tough act to follow. Again, this is one that you're going to want to watch, and due to the first movie's short runtime, you can very easily watch it as a double feature. Innocence enters the list at an A. Although not a one-to-one -one recreation of the manga, Standalone Complex Season 1 and Second Gig is my favorite entry into the franchise, and in my opinion is the best place to start if you want a little taste of everything. You'll come to learn through this video that most movies and shows in the GITS verse demand subsequent viewings to really understand what's going on, and SAC is really no different. Despite complex political plotlines where you're getting peppered with names and concepts, SAC is the catch-all for everything good in the franchise, and does explain things more eloquently than in the manga. Animation that doesn't stray too far from the 95 anime, and interesting stories to do with transhumanism, section 9, corruption, and cyber-terrorism are all punctuated with the very best that Ghost in the Shell offers with standout complex episodes. Now, Standalone Complex is split into standalone or individual episodes and complex episodes. The standalone episodes are one-off stories told through the perspective of Section 9, whereas the complex episodes follow a larger arc in each of the two seasons, the first being the Laughing Man saga and the second being based on the refugee crisis in Dejima. Both of these complex threads are absolutely fantastic, and it's really hard to pick a favorite between these two. Season 1 feels like it's a smarter story, whereas Season 2 feels like it's more emotionally gripping. 
Season 2 also amplifies the gore and violence and increases the animation quality, so there's a bit of a progression that you'll see jumping from one season to the next. When it comes to the standalone episodes, most were compelling and there are even episodes with 100% dialogue or discussions that were shockingly enjoyable as well. I've alluded to this earlier, but what I've come to find out with Ghost in the Shell is that many of the episodes that focus on other members of Section 9, specifically Togusa, are much more interesting than following the Major. The Major seems to integrate and work best post-Puppeteer, and you'll know what that means when you do give that storyline your time. Maybe it's because Togusa is the character we can most relate with, but even episodes focused on Bato are by far some of my favorites. The first two seasons of Standalone Complex are wrapped up with feature film Solid State Society and follows Togusa for most of it, which again is one of the best if not the best character. SSS piggybacks mainly off of Second Gig and expands on the transhumanist concept central to the Second Gig story. It has better animation and music than even Second Gig and even manages to rile up some motions, something that SAC overall doesn't really lean too heavily into. SAC, SAC Second Gig, and SSS are all must-watches and enter the tier list at an S alongside the legendary 95 anime, albeit for different reasons. If you do prefer reading, there is also a one-to-one -one retelling of SAC in manga form. Now we have the issue of Standalone Complex 2045, which is the entry I have the most mixed feelings about. The elephant in the room here is the 3D CGI animation style. On one hand, we get to see elements of the Ghost in the Shell universe in three dimensions, which is great for pieces of technology, the city, thermoptic camo, the net, the tachikomas, and some of the other facets that up until this point have been strictly in 2D. It also seems to work nicely for screenshots. Key art for the show looks good because the characters still have this manga, anime-like stylized look that when not in motion actually doesn't look half bad. That being said, the actual animations and movements of the characters are crude, their models carry little to no animation, and the action sequences can feel downright comical. The environments are more realistic than the characters, which create this incongruence, and not in a good way, which is another issue I have with SAC 2045. If you're a 90s baby and you remember the show Reboot, this kind of feels like the modern day aesthetic of that show, which isn't overly complimentary. That being said, 2045 takes place 11 years after the events of Solid State Society after an economic disaster known as the Simultaneous Global Default, which has destroyed the value of all forms of paper and electronic currency. The world is involved in a sustainable war, a never-ending war to keep the economy afloat, and introduces the post-human arc. 2045 really only starts to show the strength of its storytelling in Season 2 and towards the tail end of it. 2045 Season 1 starts off very sluggishly, but by the final episodes of Season 2, it pulled me back in with a mind-bending concept pretty much on par with the one posed in second gig. The issue is that 85% of 2045 is a build up to this moment, and you might not have the endurance to make it to this point, and I wouldn't even blame you for it. 2045 also creates some really emotional moments mainly from Bato's perspective, and again introduces the post-humans which are worthy insertions into the world. Up until the ending, which is probably one of the hardest concepts to understand and wrap your brain around, it's one of the easier plots to follow, so if you feel like the prior entries are too dense, this might be a bit of an easier watch. That being said, 2045 is very forgettable, and I'd place this on the tier list at a C. Now unfortunately, it doesn't get any better with Arise, a story of how a young Kusanagi met the other members of Section 9 and how the team was formed. Again, remember that these variants of ghosts from the manga to the anime to the shows are set in different universes, so there may be a lack of continuity between them. Arise is a confusing one, but these episodes are segmented into 60 minute episodes called Borders. Arise Alternate Architecture also reorders these 60 minute episodes and adds two new ones at the end before leading into the new movie, a full length film that ties up Arise. If you're watching this after 2045, you're probably going to be thrilled that they've moved back to the 2D animation. The design in Arise feels much more stylized and out there than SAC which prefers a more grounded look. Arise has great animations, fight scenes, hacking visuals, music, character design, and yet still manages to be the most unfulfilling entry into the universe. It is the most confusing entry by far, it introduces new voice actors for the dub, and creates little to no chemistry between characters as they form Section 9, which is a letdown knowing that this is meant to be their origin story. It also has this weird psychedelic-like dream state quality to it, which you get a sense of right as the intro kicks off. Arise was the only time during my deep dive where I actually felt bored. It jumps all over the place and feels like the biggest departure from the core soul of the rest of the media. I did, however, kind of jive with the new movie, a full-length feature film that ends Arise. Now, I'm not sure if you need context from the regular Border episodes for the movie, having watched it in that order, but try jumping straight into the Arise movie and avoiding the Borders if Arise is something that you want to experience. 
Overall, even the stylish meat space to net animations, the gorgeous cityscape shots, and the better pacing in the movie don't manage to save it overall. It kind of feels like the live action movie in this sense. Also, if you are more into reading or the manga, then there's also Arise the Sleepless Eye. This is strictly in Japanese, although there is a fan translation in English for the first six chapters. I wasn't able to find this, but from what I've seen, it looks like it could be on par with the human algorithm, at least in terms of the quality of the art. Now if you've heard of Ghost in the Shell but only in passing, it's most likely either the 1995 anime or the 2017 live action. The live action film very loosely follows the plot of the 1995 anime, changes it in odd ways like fusing the puppet master and Kuze into one character, and in my opinion is a shitty amalgamation of seemingly random parts of the universe, completely lacking in heart, soul, depth, and intrigue. There's no lead up and setup for the philosophical themes, it's mostly poorly paced, and none of the moments of contemplation are given the room to breathe and aerate. The writing and dialogue ebbs from flat to hard to listen to, the characters, specifically Matoko, otherwise known as Mira and Johansson, and the laughably awful casting of Togusa, just make this movie feel like the people behind it were looking to make a quick Hollywood buck. Heady philosophical themes have proven to not work from a sales perspective in years past, with some of my recent favorites like Blade Runner 2049 and Annihilation being box office failures, so it's kind of a sad and unfortunate reality. If there is one consolation for the live action movie, it is the absolutely incredible shots and conceptualizations of Newport City. The environments, costumes, and art direction has been nailed, and I'm a huge fan of pretty much all the pieces of concept art from the film, from names like Machai Kuchara, Andrew Baker, and Nick Keller. The brain dives are artistically and visually awe-inspiring, and some of the action scenes have interesting backdrops and presentations, but unfortunately, that's where the Rupert Sanders movie starts and ends for me. I highly recommend watching the scenes with the vistas of the city and taking a look at the concept art, but other than that, skipping this one altogether. On the tier list, the live action sadly sits at AD. So there you guys have it. Start with standalone complex and the manga. The manga is where it all begins and offers absolutely amazing art and insights into the complex inner workings of the source material's creator, alongside masterful drawings. The human algorithm nests nicely within these and tells a great story, so I would recommend this one as well. Standalone Complex Season 1, Second Gig, and Solid State Society is the best this franchise has to offer, and it's the most well-rounded option and the one that you're likely going to be rewatching. If you like philosophical themes about consciousness, existence, and what it means to be human over the layered political and espionage angle, then the artistic pinnacle of Ghost in the Shell 1995 is for you. Follow that up with Innocence. In my opinion, all of these will give you the best of Ghost in the Shell, and further inspection into other works might disappoint you. If you guys want to get into the various animes, 9 Anime or Adult Swim is the best resource, and for the books, I have some Amazon links in the description. Now there is a novel, some video games, and some shorts that I didn't get into with Ghost in the Shell, but these are pretty fringe and lesser well known. But if you have read, watched, or played any of these, let us know in the comments below with your takes on them. I hope you guys liked that deep dive into the world of Ghost in the Shell, one of the most influential works when it comes to the cyberpunk genre. Unfortunately, there's not as much backstory as something like Cyberpunk 2020 or Pondsmith's Universe, but it's still nice to dip your toes into what's out there. This was the first episode, so there's definitely room for changes going forward. I'd love to know what else you'd want to hear about in these videos, or what parts of the video you could have done without. Let me know what you guys think about Ghost in the Shell, and for more Cyberpunk 101, make sure that you are subscribed.